My sister Cora and I were exactly eleven years, two months, and thirteen days old when I first met Mr. Fig. My name is Clara, and Cora and I are twins, identical twins who are nevertheless very much different in constitution and outlook, and things like that. We had been coming to this house by the sea with our parents every summer since, well, they had been coming here since long before we were born. The house had belonged to some old uncle of father's who was long dead. He had left it to our family in some papers that Mr. James brought for father to sign one cold winter's afternoon, when Cora and I, we were just five. I remember it very well, but Cora does not. She can be that way sometimes. Anyway. This story is about Mr. Fig. All the houses along the water were very large and primarily the summer havens for people we mostly knew in town. Mr. Fig and his sister. I think she was his sister. Although now that I look back on it, I rather imagine she was not his sister at all or in any real way related to him. At least not like Cora and me. Mr. Fig and the lady, Miss Jane lived in a huge old crumbling stone mansion on the hill overlooking the rest of our friendly houses and little bungalows, like a stern nurse or school teacher, hoping the rest of us would just once get out of line. That was how my sister and I talked about that dark looming fortress, so unlike the rest of our bright and cheery summer getaways. These two lived in the house year round, so their routines and daily outings were very much unlike our own. Each morning after breakfast, we children of all the residences up and down the shore would stake out our jealously guarded territories on the beach and begin the daily activities normal to people of our age. The grown-ups would lounge about, go into town to little shops, then stroll by the waters and take quick dips before returning to their afternoon rituals of cards and cocktails, things from which we were strictly excluded. The rituals and activities of Mr. Fig and Miss Jane were quite different. Now that I think of it, I'm not sure how we knew their names were Mr. Fig and Miss Jane, other than perhaps we heard the grown-ups talking in their hushed whispers about the pair. We certainly were never introduced, nor did they ever visit any of our homes for the grand parties that went on nightly, and to which all were warmly invited. These several irregularities, of course, caused the mysterious pair to become at first an object of curiosity, once I grew to the age of curiosity and then fascination and downright obsession when I reached the mature age of eleven. But it must be confirmed that this keen interest was mostly on my part, but of course Cora always wanted to hear all about it. It started like this. Each afternoon, long past the time when most people, grown-ups and children, had returned to the great houses along the water to bathe and dress for supper and the night's formal reveries, Miss Jane would wheel Mr. Fig who was confined to a wheelchair, from his place on the shore down to the water's edge, where he would just stare out to sea. Miss Jane would leave him there until dark and then, presumably, collect him and bring him back to the dark crumbling mansion on the hill for whatever nightly engagements they might pursue. Mr. Fig was a curious sort. I could not tell how old he was, for he had apparently suffered some terrible accident that left him disfigured in his youth. I had gleaned this from more of the whisperings from my elders, so I took this to be the irrefutable truth. Whenever I saw him, he was wrapped with a blanket round his legs. He wore a heavy coat, dark glasses, and a big floppy hat pulled low over his face, and I wondered how he could see the sun and see it all. Mr. Fig made rather a sad figure sitting there all by himself with no one to talk to and no grown-up stopping to share the news of the day if they happened to be taking a late afternoon stroll along the sunset shore. I had witnessed Miss Jane depositing Mr. Fig on the beach each day like this. Well, forever, as long as I could remember. I wanted to know what had happened to Mr. Fig. Had he been burned so that his skin was too delicate to endure the sun and wind of the sea? Surely he became overheated dressed so heavily. It became altogether too much for me to endure speculating upon these matters without gaining more tangible information. One day, after we had all returned home and I was supposed to be at my bath, while my parents and several other grown-ups sat downstairs laughing quite loudly and playing music on the phonograph, I left my sister to her games with our little brother and slipped unseen out of the house. 
I ran down to the water's edge and saw the lone, sad figure of Mr. Fig sitting in his wheelchair. There was no one else around. I started walking slowly towards him along the water line. As I passed him, he just sat there and paid me no mind. The second day, when I walked past him, I waved, but again, he just sat there and could have been a mannequin for all I knew. The third day, I wandered quite close to the silent figure, hoping to get some sign from him. I was within just a few feet from him when a screaming figure flew over the sand yelling at me. It was Miss Jane, and she was waving her arms madly, a crazed look on her face, telling me to get away, to go home immediately and leave them alone or she would complain to my parents. You must understand, Miss Jane was quite a frightful figure. She was very tall and willow-thin, and even on the beach she wore what looked like weeds such as widows wear, or at least a very severe and all-covered-up costume with dark hose and button-up shoes. But there was no mistaking the look of anger and menace on that face, so I ran straight for home and didn't once look back. I took my bath and put on my clean dress Nora, mother's lady, had laid out for me, and made it down to table just in time for the first course. Cora glared at me in that accusing sort of way she has that seems to say, See, I am a good girl and who knows where you have been. Mother glanced at me and smiled her polite, distant smile that contained a distinct undercurrent of reproach known only to her children. Father didn't seem to notice and just went on talking about numbers to Mr. Bender, who owns the house next door, who, along with his wife and two sons, added to the large party we had to dinner each night. I could think of nothing, of course, except Miss Jane and Mr. Fig. It seemed so odd. Even as Miss Jane ran screaming to chase me away, Mr. Fig just sat there, saying nothing and not moving, and I began to wonder if his infirmities were worse than was believed and he was actually paralyzed. That thought made me even more sad, and I determined that I would make contact with this enigmatic Mr. Fig and be kind to him. Miss Jane did not frighten me too much. What could she do to me, after all? And besides, I knew I could easily outrun her. For the next several days, I walked slowly by the dark figure in his wheelchair, not drawing any closer nor passing farther away. The week after that, I grew bolder. There had been no more Miss Jane sightings, and I thought she must be resting comfortably in the belief that I had been taught a lesson and driven off for good. Nothing could have been farther from the truth. So on the fourth day, a Thursday, of my second week of these vigils, I decided to slowly ease my way closer to Mr. Fig, as one might try to seduce a stray cat into accepting a scratch on the neck or a bowl of milk. The next day I drew even closer, and the day after that closer still. The following day, I grew even bolder and walked close enough past him to reach out and touch him, if I had dared. As I passed, I glanced back and saw his head move almost imperceptibly in my direction, and then return his gaze to the sea. The next day it was the same, only that afternoon as I passed him, I said, hello, but kept moving. The next day, my greeting was met with a turn of the head and a very slight smile across the broad mouth and a slow nod in my direction. I was making real headway and this only emboldened me further believing myself to somehow have gained Mr. Fig's approval and authorization to proceed with my encroachment upon his privacy. On the Wednesday of that next week, I stopped and stood right next to Mr. Fig, and together we stared for some time at the sea as the red-gold orb of the sun melted into the horizon. After two more afternoons of this, I felt a slight tap on my arm as I stood there next to Mr. Fig. He was offering me his gloved hand. I took his hand and he gripped mine firmly and gave it a quick shake, followed by a brisk nod of the head. I was elated. As soon as I could, without being perceived as rude, I ran back to my house, giddy with delight. By now my family was used to me sliding into my seat just moments before my absence would become alarming. I decided then to take things to the next level. One night after dinner, when the grown-ups had retired to the parlor for grown-up conversations and refreshments. I slipped out of the house and ran down to the beach. From a distance, I saw Mr. Fig still sitting quietly, watching the moon rise over the black waters. 
I was grateful that Miss Jane had not yet come to collect him. I took up a hiding place behind a nearby dune. I wanted to see if there might be any more to be learned from the end of Mr. Fig's daily ritual, and I was rewarded for all my patient persistence. Before long, Miss Jane came trudging through the sand in her laced-up shoes. She came up to Mr. Fig and, instead of turning his wheelchair around so she could get him back up to their house, she did the most curious thing. She pulled off the blanket that wrapped his legs, tossed his hat and glasses into the sand, and helped him to stand up. Then she helped him out of his long, heavy coat, which she folded over her lap. Then she sat down in the wheelchair. I watched in marveled awe as Mr. Fig ran naked into the cold waters of the sea as they lapped and broke upon the sands. His skin seemed tanned or dark in a peculiar way, but I could not see him clearly. He slipped beneath the waters and just disappeared. I watched and waited, growing more frightened by the moment as he did not reappear and return to the beach. Miss Jane just sat there quietly, seemingly unconcerned for her companion's disappearance. I waited as long as I could, then returned to the house before Mother discovered I was gone, or Cora decided to tell on me. I couldn't say a word, of course, because I was strictly forbidden to be out at night or to play near the water after dark. Besides, Miss Jane would call for help, surely, if Mr. Fig was in any danger. So I went to bed, but did not sleep, considering all that I had seen. The next morning when I ran down to the beach, Fearful that I would find it empty of all but noisy children and their sandcastles, I was elated to see the dark figure in his wheelchair, sitting once again at its post near the water's edge, blanket, coat, hat, and glasses obscuring all from sun and scrutiny. I wasted no time before I wandered past and waved and said hello, again greeted by the nod of the head and the wave of a black-gloved hand. That night I was again on duty observing all there was to see from behind my dune. As the night before, Miss Jane arrived and soon Mr. Fig had bounded into the sea. Several more nights bore out like this and, on one cool late summer evening, the dark figure broke the surface of the sea and a hand and arm reached up and waved. Not at Miss Jane, but in my direction. I almost cried out and ran to the water's edge, but kept my place worried that this intrusion might be just too much of an affront for the enigmatic and protective Miss Jane. After a few more nights of this vigil, I watched again one evening from my dune, but Miss Jane did not appear. After quite some time, I feared that something might have happened and Mr. Fig would have nobody to bring him back home. I waited a while longer, but still, no Miss Jane. So I steeled myself to go down and see if I might help. I walked up to Mr. Fig and he held out his hand, motioning to the blanket on his lap. I'm not sure why, but without another thought I reached out and did all that I had seen Miss Jane do. I dragged the blanket away from Mr. Fig's legs, took off his hat and glasses, and gasped. Mr. Fig looked very strange, but the broad smile with her thin pale lips and the golden light that danced in his large round eyes completely disarmed me. And I smiled back. I helped Mr. Fig get to his feet and he removed his gloves and pulled off his coat. He was very strange indeed. His skin was rather bumpy and of a very dark olive hue, more so than any Mediterranean person I had ever seen. What happened next I shall never forget. Mr. Fig took my hand in his peculiarly webbed fingers and then we ran together over the beach and into the waters and disappeared beneath the waves. We swam for what seemed like hours and to black depths where there were no more fish at all, but only the very strangest creatures I have ever seen. Mr. Fig never let go of my hand, and I only wondered that I could breathe easily for a moment or two, only praying that this was real and not some childish dream from too much strawberries and cream after dinner. You might think that I was afraid, but how could I be? Mr. Fig held my hand tightly and I was filled with such feelings of friendship. I wondered if Miss Jane ever swam with Mr. Fig like this or what she would think of me doing it. After what seemed like days but was altogether too short, we returned to the shallows and then broke the waves and crawled up onto the sand. Standing there glaring at us both was Miss Jane. Her arms were crossed over her chest 
and she had such a look of anger that I could not tell if it was aimed at me, or Mr. Fig, or us both. She shot an angry, pointed arm back over the beach toward my house, and I scrambled like crazy over the sand to get away. When I reached the house, I entered through the cook's door and made my way through the silent house, out of my dripping clothes and into my nightgown. Cora was fast asleep, so there were no bothersome questions to be answered. The next morning I went down to breakfast, planning to eat my scones and tea quickly, and then return to the beach to see what new adventures and information might be forthcoming today. When I left the breakfast room, I heard Father talking with someone in the front hall. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but it seemed a rather one-sided, animated conversation, in hushed tones, with Father uttering a lot of, Yes, I see, of courses. I stepped up to the door to the parlor, where there is a large mirror. I could make out the tall, dark figure of Miss Jane standing in the door, so I hid until she was gone. Father returned to the breakfast room for another cup of coffee, and as soon as I knew Miss Jane would be long gone, I raced down to the beach. Mr. Fig was not there, and he didn't come all day. Mr. Fig did not come the next day either, or the day after that, nor did I ever see Mr. Fig or Miss Jane again. I overheard Father talking to Mr. Bender about how Miss Jane had visited him one morning, saying they were moving far away. She gave Father the key to their house and asked if he would give it to the real estate agent that was coming in a few days. Of course he had agreed, and that was that. All of that seems as vivid and fresh in my mind now that I am a full eighty and some odd extra years old, as it did at the time. I never knew why Mr. Fig and Miss Jane left our seaside enclave so quickly, but I have a suspicion. When I was grown, I spent time every summer scouring the seacoast towns for any sign of them, asking if anyone knew of a strange man in a wheelchair and his tall, stern companion. There was never any word or news, of course, but I always wondered why, when Miss Jane had come running over the sand those times, waving her arms and yelling at me to get away, if she was in fact yelling at me, or at Mr. Fig. There was no reason for that, as no harm had ever come to me. In fact, while as a child I always loved to wade among the shallows, as I grew older, it became my greatest passion of all to swim alone out beyond those shallows into the cold, dark deeps. To this very day, despite my advanced years, I swim daily in the sea. In the last few months, however, amidst the protestations and alarm of the doddering, mirthless Cora and the younger generations of my many progeny, I have developed a pronounced preference for the night swim, clothed only in my shivering nakedness.